So good afternoon everyone, good evening for some of you, almost good evening maybe if you join us from India and welcome to this second virtual dialogue on coping strategies during the pandemic. My name is Basil and I work for the EADI. We are the European Association of Development Research and Training Institutes and we work in improving the visibility of development studies throughout Europe as well as promoting cooperation between different members across countries. Please do check the other events we have lined up on our website at eadi.org under the events tab and you can register for several other virtual dialogues there. Today we are delighted to welcome Mr. Vitayan who will deliver a talk on Kerala's response to the COVID-19 pandemic and we are also very happy to welcome Isa Bolt from the University of Amsterdam who will introduce the speaker in just a moment. Isa is Professor of International Development and Chair of the Knowledge Platform on Inclusive Development in the Netherlands and she was also our President here at EADI for about six years. Today's talk will last for 20 minutes and will be followed by a Q&A and discussion session for about 35 minutes. And therefore, can I please kindly ask you to keep questions for the end and once the talk is over, you can write them on the chat and they will be taken up by um, Isa who will lead the discussion. So is that the floor is yours. Thank you to uh, introduce the speaker now. Thank you very much, Basil. We have today with us SM Vijayanand, a very distinguished speaker, and I'm very interested to hear what you're going to say about Kerala as being always a prime example for the way that state governments can play a very positive role in uh, Indian development. You were former chief secretary to the government of Kerala, and you've been extensively involved in Kerala's decentralization processes. You have earlier, you served as secretary to the government of India in the ministry of the Panchayat Raj, and you've also been involved in strengthening civil society organizations such as women's self-help groups. And you were also a member secretary of the SEN Committee on Democratic Decentralization. So very welcome indeed. We're quite looking forward to hearing you talk. The floor is yours, please. Professor Riza and uh, friends, thank you for inviting me. Uh, because of the local protocol, I have to wear the mask. I think that's not affecting my talk, my, the voice. Okay, because I am sitting in a government building, so it's the protocol. Now, to start, Kerala has the largest risk factors in the context of COVID. An aging population, more than 16 plus 15 to 16% is above 60, and highest incidence of non-communicable diseases. And two and a half million people from outside the state working here, and two and a half million people from the state working outside. So mobility in and out is uh, very common. So, and these are the risk factors. Compared to the risk factors, Kerala did very well, phenomenally well in the earlier stages. I'm not uh, so confident today uh, because there has been a spike in the last 20, 25 days. Uh, and we have now about 175,000 cases so far, out of which 100,000 came in the last four weeks. So there has been a spike and uh, there are about 56,000 active cases as on day. But the fortunate thing is that the case fat fatality has been only 0.39. Whereas India has been kind of 1.58. And I understand the world rate is almost double the Indian rate. So that way, that is one of the saving grace. And uh, we had a very strict lockdown along with the rest of India. And then returnees started coming from different parts of India. That brought a spike, early spike. But the state has been able to, what they call, keep ahead of the virus. So far, so good. Even today, they've been able to keep, uh, they're studying the cause of the virus and ramping up facilities in a dynamic way so that we are not, the capacity will not be overtaken, but we are getting stressed for the last three weeks. So now, quick summary of Kerala strategies. This is a current situation. As I said, it's not a very happy situation. And we will know whether the Kerala model has succeeded maybe in two to three weeks. We are hopeful anyway. So the biggest success was advanced action, probably the best in the world, even if you take big countries. We had a bad bout of Nipah virus, but confined to a locality with high fatality, but the health department learned and internalized the lesson, which is not very common in a public setup, how to trace, isolate, treat, 
and protect other people. That is a big lesson. This happened in 2018. Somehow, we never expected that, that to be internalized to that extent. And we have a health minister who has been much written about in world media. She's a very sensitive kind of person. On 12th of January, without any officer or expert uh, realizing this, she read, she saw on TV that in China there is a deadly virus. And she knew in Wuhan there are about 500, 600 persons from Kerala residing in Wuhan. So she it just hit her that they may come back. She immediately summoned the people, set up a rapid response team in five, six days. And by 24th, the control room was operational in Kerala, even before the first case was noted anywhere outside China, except perhaps Taiwan, there was a case. And they started airport screening and state level guidelines were issued. So this anticipatory preparedness has been the strategy right through and so far successful, even though we are getting stressed at this point in time. Then, as I told you, because of the experience, a very good surveillance system that again is unique, even in the country and probably among many countries, is that it's led by the doctors and the field workers. And we have informal health field workers called ASHAs. So they're actually, they are paid a very small amount, but they are in the forefront. They go collect feedback from the people, reach out to people. The ASHA workers are not permanent health staff, but are trained and used. A kind of a barefoot kind of volunteer. But unique feature, which I'll explain later, is a combination of local governments, what we call panchayats and municipalities. Panchayats are rural local governments in India. And in partnership with the community-based organizations. That again is a high watermark of Kerala's recent development. We have the self-help groups of women. And it's a huge number. We have about 300,000 self-help groups covering about 4 India million women. And Kerala has a population of around 8 million families. So uh, 80 million. So we have 4 India million people working. Uh, sorry, 8 million families. 4 India million women are there as part of Kudumbashri. It's an organized thing. And they are federated at the level of the local government. So it's a very well organized, what we call community-based organizations. Supplemented by volunteers. There was an appeal to volunteers to join. And 300,000 volunteers uh, joined the team. So at the panchayat, electoral constituency of a panchayat. Normally a panchayat is a population of around 25, 30,000. There will be about 20 wards in a panchayat. So each ward level, a population of around 2,000 or so, there, there will be a rapid response team with volunteers, the ASHA worker, health worker, the Kudumbashri, the self-help group thing. So in a sense, it's public action in practice, outreach, participation, and most importantly, the trust element. You're close at hand and you can just, you have a phone call away or even, even walk across and find out. And very important in these times of crisis, now Kerala, because of the, to avoid unnecessary pressure on the hospital, they have been advising asymptomatic cases of relatively young people who have a good num uh, number of rooms, safe rooms and independent toilets and all that in houses to stay in your house. But it's a high risk thing. They are contacted two, three times a day by a health worker, which is again, that intermediation is again a unique feature. And then numbers are given and the person, if he suddenly has, he feels feverish or something, they, he or she can ring up. I know it from personal experience. My wife is a medical officer in charge of a community health center in a hotspot. So I know the number of calls and the, the way they do. So this intermediation is personal and it's 100%. So there is some trust. Suddenly, if I develop fever, they will, somebody will pick up and uh, take you to the hospital. So now another thing is a dynamic planning related to surveillance and advanced action. Right from the beginning, initially government hospitals, they have only about 40,000 beds in government hospitals. The private hospitals have about almost 100,000 beds, little less than that. So, but we can't burden the mainstream hospitals. So they started what they call first level treatment centers. Large halls, schools converted, where doctors will be there 24 into 7, nurses and basic medicine and all your things. But if you develop some other complication, you're immediately shifted. So ambulance also will be there. So this helped ease the situation. As of now, 
there are 222 active first level treatments covering about 30, 32,000 beds. So in a sense, they have been able to enhance the bed strength because of this. Now realizing that things are not that easy and smooth, they have started now about 40 second level treatment centers, which will have little more kind of a mobile x-ray, some uh, oxygen, high flow oxygen, and those kind of things. So this advanced planning is what is going. Now they know by 30th of uh, September, if this is the worst case scenario, we will have so many beds scattered all over Kerala so that you're not caught napping. Then of course they did local preparation of sanitizers and masks and all that, I'll come to that later. Another important strategy which they have done is what they call reverse quarantine. You can't quarantine all the risk at risk people. So the reverse quarantine, I think in the Western world, they use the word uh, shielding. So shielding those vulnerable, particularly our aged population and uh, those who are having non-communicable diseases. But every person is alert for reaching out to people, getting feedback, talking to people. Fortunately, most of the people have telephones now in, as mobiles. So that connectivity is uh, done. And as of now, as I mentioned earlier, uh, in some districts, even 30% of the people are in are at home, being treated at home. Medicines are sent and they are looked after. Of course, we had a bad lockdown and uh, that was managed very well through multi-level coordination. Again, the hallmark of Kerala's coordination is a friend line kind of coordination at the cutting edge, which is, uh, which is really uh, very good and feedback loops right from household came into thing. Then the social protection part. Again, I'm only highlighting the unique features of the Kerala model and not the other kind of war room and other which exists all over the world. The earliest announcement of a comprehensive package reaching out to the last. You like that because it's a real inclusion. Nobody was left. And that was announced in mid-March before the crisis really started. So some not big amounts, thousand rupees immediately to buy certain things. Pensions, social pensions, social welfare pensions. We have about 4.8 million social welfare pensions. Uh, so 4.8 million people are covered. Not a big amount, about 1,200, 1,300 rupees, but enough to buy your free rations. There's an excellent public distribution system. And most important, most sensitive, the migrant workers in Kerala, they were taken care of from the day, from day one about 1,300 camps, uh, sorry, about 20,000 camps of migrants were set up. One third of the camps in India were in Kerala and Kerala is only 3% of India's population. That was a affidavit filed before the Supreme Court by government of India. Then all of them is an assurance that they will be given food. So in each village, uh, local government, community kitchens were started and food was delivered at home. Then of course, the care of the elderly, telehealth centers. Now, post June, when schools reopen, of course, schools are not reopened, online education and government took care, almost like a challenge that if anybody doesn't have a mobile, a smartphone to listen to the online classes, yes, we will supply. So, like that, I think probably 80, 90 persons, a percent of the people have been reached out to. So, there, a very sensitive thing I should mention. In one of the talks, the chief minister uh, said, don't leave the stray animals alone. Feed them also. So we reached that level of sensitivity during this social protection part. Then honest messaging, communication, which is again a high water mark. I've been seeing the BBC with the PM and other secretaries coming and talking to the thing. Kerala is on par or even better in terms of communicating to the people. The chief minister on six o'clock every evening on working days talks to the people, no holds barred, facts are given, slippages are openly admitted, dangers are, I mean, uh, highlighted, problems, and then what is in store. So yesterday, the health minister said we could have a very dangerous situation by mid-October if we are not careful. So, and more important, assurances. This is what we will do. And if you have any problem, get back to us. And Kerala being a very vibrant 
a kind of democracy people so this absorbs a lot of tension the biggest problem in these kind of things is uncertainty and tension so when the chief minister himself commits in public over the media yes these are the things we are giving then accessing is easy then of course outreach and the policy of none left behind and including migrants so this has been broadly the kerala strategy but how could kerala do this how is it different from rest of india first is the human development focus right from the 19th century the first public hospital was started in 1818 by the king of the southern part of kerala called travancore so then there was a very funny thing kerala had a unusually harsh caste system which it should be ashamed about and but still development inclusion and social exclusion you find it very difficult to understand that paradox it happened in the early part of the hospitals and schools were thrown open to everybody but at the same time casteism was at its worst at its peak so much so our swami vivekananda called kerala a lunatic asylum and another interesting uh, highlight of kerala social reform movements this took place among the backward classes who are in a majority they all wanted right to education and saw education as a liberating force which is unusual and there was one the first agriculture strike in agitation and strike in probably in india was organized for getting right to admission in school not for higher wages so these kind of things happened and always the states have been responsive whether it was a monarchy or indi independent kerala trying to meet people halfway through so this accommodating state and demanding public and demanding of course in a constitutional sense is been again a hallmark of this post independence the welfare agenda was pursued further across governments land reforms public distribution system and kerala has for the last uh, 53 years has been having only coalition governments and interestingly after the formation of kerala in 1956 no government has ever come back to power except once so it's a very peculiar kind of politics really adversarial politics now we are seeing one of the worst phases of adversarial politics and uh, but still every section gets some part of the power because of two coalitions they kind of bring in all sections of society barring perhaps the uh, the tribals the ethnic minorities who constitute just 1.4 percent, and that's one of the outliers of the Kerala model. The famed Kerala model excludes, not excludes, two sections of society have not benefited to the extent they should have. One is what are called the tribals, the original inhabitants. They are mostly in the hills, and then the traditional fisher folk who live in the coast. Both together, they should be constituting about 2.5 percent of the population. Then, what saved Kerala? Or we were the poorest state. in india in 1960s and the gulf migration and kerala's have been migrating from time immemorial that really saved kerala a lot of jobs came and the service sector grew and growth which was just 1% to 2% in the 80 till 80s suddenly took off and now kerala's growth rate is a healthy 7.5 8.5% which is just about the indian growth rate of course we should not take the current year then the social capital is again very important and kerala launched the first literacy movement uh, in 1989 1990 where most of the illiterates were made literate all by volunteers and it was it took a 8 to 9 months campaign to achieve this then came which is very important what we call the people's plan campaign in 1996 a big bang dam decentralization took place 25% of our development funds we call it plan in our local parliaments a plan is for new development and non plan is for revenue and other thing so 25% of the plan and most of the human development and social development functions and minimum needs have been transferred to local governments and participatory budgeting was started which again is a norm. then as i mentioned earlier social capital is very strong the culture of organization the culture of people coming together volunteerism and uh created social capital that's an interesting phenomena how the self help groups were facilitated by government 
but they are autonomous to a large extent. They're independent of the local governments, but equal to local governments. So this is government creating a social capital, which now in these times of need has proved very helpful. Public health focus is the next why Kerala was able to do. The public health focus, the primary health care focus. Of course, there are a lot of hospitals in the secondary and tertiary, and that helped. And the local the health institutions up to the district level, that is primary and secondary, were transferred to local governments. And over the years, and there is evidence, hard evidence, that access of government, access to government hospitals, which declined in the 1990s to a very low of 24% of the people using government hospitals. Uh, it climbed up to 33% in 2014, and now it is 47.8%. They are all national sample survey organization data. It's not a local data. Then one in aspect which has been applauded internationally is the palliative care movement in Kerala. They, they all show inclusion and outreach. About 150,000 people who are in the bed, no hope of cure, and they are all being reached out to through the village panchayats, through the municipalities, at least once a month. And food, everything is provided to them. Very, very sensitive kind of thing, and it works. And another point I want to mention, how Kerala has been able to do, the way Keralaites treat migrants. Keralaites in the Gulf, good number of them, read a very rough life. They know how tough it is to work in a different country. So that sensitivity, that empathy applies to Kerala's consideration of migrants in Kerala. So no stigma, no discrimination, and they understand their troubles and they are paid equally. There's no less payment for migrants in Kerala. Now, what are the challenges immediately after this? Health is going to be a challenge. Once I said the increasing cases, but much more, the other health care, which stood Kerala in good stead, the children's health, women's health, uh, aged, elderly, they are all going to be challenges. Now, they have been able to balance. That's another unique feature. Probably compared to the rest of India, Kerala has been able to manage the traditional health, normal health thing. They have not stopped it completely. But this surge is carrying us. And livelihoods is going to be a challenge. One lucky thing is only 300,000 people returned from the Gulf. So it was initially predicted Gulf may collapse. And a lot of people, half of the Kerala's would come back. Fortunately, that fears they are unfounded. And public finance is going to take a big hit. It's been calculated that huge amount uh, we will lose uh, in, in, in billions. We will be uh, losing uh, as old revenue and government uh, transfers. Because Kerala has a heavy salary component. Because it spends a lot of money on teachers, uh, doctors and health personnel. It's uh, what they call salary, pension and interest. It is more than the state's own revenue. So that's the uh, uh, one negative of the Kerala model. So before concluding, let me tell you, you can't create a culture or a system in, during an emergency. So the social capital, the participatory processes and systems like the community-based systems, Reducing the distance between the citizens and government and bringing about some trust. So people being treated as citizens in a real 21st century sense of the term. And community involved and some kind of a social contract which has been strengthened over the years. In many states, you find them getting weakened. But here it's quite strong. That combination of social and political democracy, to some extent, uh, trust. Some of you must have heard of Patrick Heller, who has studied a lot on Kerala. He is a professor now in the Brown University. He wrote when the COVID hit Kerala that there's a large area of interface between the people and government through the local government and through the SLG system. So it's a smooth interface between the people and the government. So inclusion, dignity, and non stigma So we now claim, those of us who have been in government and still associated with government in some form, that Kerala is trying to move from a welfare state uh, to a caring state. And I'm hopeful, based on the foundation of human development and social capital, we will survive the surge which has now happened. Thank you.
Thank you very much indeed for this very interesting introduction on the Kerala model, especially in the context of the new spike and the rising number of cases, even, even in Kerala itself. I think there are a number of issues that would be interesting to focus on. One is uh, which some of the participants have raised is whether they would, they would like to know whether the political parties were supportive and the steps, if any, that the ruling party had to take to build consensus. This is from Sura Narayan, Narayanan. And from Vishnu Menon is also, he has a question about the political parties in indicating that although they've been supported until recently, the time for local elections may bring in some divisiveness. So is that a question that we could start with, perhaps? Thank you. Yes, yeah, sure, sure. You're absolutely right. You must be reading in the media. There's been a lot of adversarial politics in the last one or two months based on some uh, issues which the opposition sees has wanted to catch on. But by and large, on COVID, there was, or I think even now there survives, some kind of consensus. Though they will say you should do more testing, you should do this. That kind of opposition reaction is there. But people have really not interfered in the COVID uh, strategies. And one important factor which we need to know, most of the friendline action is through local governments. And in Kerala, local governments are political and they are the same political formations as the state and central governments. So in any point of time, more than 40% of the local governments are with the opposition. So they can't turn it. They are all doing the same work. They are say, doing the same hard work uh, and they are the people. And then we have the ward level committees, which means all political parties are in the print line. This prevents unnecessary uh, complications. Okay. I think that's uh, quite interesting indeed, that although they're, they're in, in terms of political uh, parties, there are some adversarial politics, actually those, those uh, parties are also involved in actually in, in dealing with the COVID crisis and in fact at the local level. I think that illustrates for me a very important issue, namely that you have been able to include the different scale levels of government right from the very local ward, panchayat, uh, say local government, as well as state district and state government in these initiatives. Now that's that is, is that something particularly specific to Kerala or do you think that is a way of acting or way of mobilizing uh, governments that could also be applied in other states in India? I've been keeping in touch with mainly through the civil society organizations in most of India. Since I worked in Panchayat Raj Ministry in Delhi, I get involved in these kind of uh, webinars. I find surprisingly, even in states where the local government system is extremely weak, hardly empowered, we found the natural friend line, I would say willy-nilly, nobody designed it that way, has been a coalition of the village panchayats, the self-help groups of women, supported by civil society organizations, particularly in central India, which is poorest in terms of health facility or even in terms of uh, people's poverty levels. So they are, have been functional all, all over India, but not consciously designed uh, mm -hmm. like Kerala. So Kerala has been a well-designed system, so they could immediately get in motion, but they are still in the forefront. Do you think it's possible to strengthen the initiatives that are being taken in other, other areas of India in this way? And if so, what would be the strategies which would support them in carrying out the tasks that they've just taken up? Yeah. One, the Indian Constitution since 1994 mandates a local government system. Yeah. But the powers are to be devolved by the state government. The government of India can, the Constitution doesn't mention what are the local government powers. So in India, there are about 250,000 village panchayats. I'm mentioning in rural areas. Of course, in urban areas, there are the municipalities and big cities. So, and another lucky break is you must have heard of the Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme, mm. which has been given one lakh crore. One lakh crore in uh, dollars would mean about 20, uh, 
15 billion dollars this year uh, for and all these are planned for at the village level at the panchayat level in addition we have the 15 finance commission the 14 finance commission gave a huge bonanza uh, to the uh, village panchayats nobody expected i was secretary to government of india at that time they have given a huge bonanza for participatory plan it was 2 lakh crore which is double this amount so 2 lakh crore would uh, translate into yeah more than uh, 23 24 billion dollars so this money will go in the next five years so they have money so they can do some local activity plus the self-help group movement which started in south india has now spread to large parts of india so they i understand there are six million self-help groups all over india covering a large population each year are about 10 12 people so the self-help group working with the village panchayats can be a startup but one big gap is the primary health center system is extremely weak in most of india other than the south tamil nadu is as strong as kerala the other south indian states are okay but you will find in the rest of india they are practically absent so if you bring in a primary health system locally then probably if this can strike root okay um okay from basil would like to ask you about uh, the fact that you've indicated that not very high level technologies are needed to set up these strategies that you've been talking about for kerala so why do you think that other states have not put these kind of measures in place they are all following learning from each other even kerala learned from some other states then mumbai had a very atrocious system a team from kerala went to mumbai to try to share ideas so they are sharing experiences but as i mentioned these systems took root over years and they are the product of a policy which of course is not easy to uh, improvise all on a sudden but the panchayat system self help group system and the missing public health system could easily bring fundamental differences plus of course the big advantage of kerala has of literacy and female literacy practically 100% literacy that again is uh, much less of course is much higher now than before in rest of india you mentioned that the kerala team went to mumbai what was the issue there and what what did they learn from you specifically basically on the initial response the testing part and setting up hospitals and maybe some which of course is not disclosed the way they get treated patients because the case fatality is lowest in kerala the medicines you administer and the early care that kind of okay uh, vj would like uh, your comments on the colonial law on epidemic the epidemic diseases act and the impact of that of its enforcement and what changes need to be made in the law it's uh, one of the surprising though i myself have drafted two bills that kerala does not have a public health act we still rely on a madras public health act which were enacted by the british in the 1920s and kerala just just adopted it there were several rounds of discussion and bills were made but they didn't take it seriously of course the epidemiological old uh, act is dated and they were all in the 19th century mindset of uh, seeing diseases as a kind of a not as suffering and to be that but as, a, as a, something to be punished that kind of thing so we really need a new law i'm sure just after covid subsides at least in kerala there would be a good law based on experiences over the last 20 25 years local giving local government space giving community space and these kind of preventive measures uh, would be in good interestingly i want to tell you because our big problem we have got over the normal communicable diseases which take a lot of lives in india even now but the new what you call the non communicable diseases the diabetes blood pressure mm-hmm. and other things are on the rise with aging population so last four five years kerala has been trying to develop a primary health care system for this we have a primary health care system for the others but how do you do how do you reach out to this person and very interesting experiments have been tried out in the last 2 3 years particularly uh, by reaching out to the uh, persons particularly the poor persons who didn't come to the hospital for diabetes so they call what are called ncd clinics are set up uh, now in most parts of kerala to 
address this if they can other they can meet yeah I had the chance to read your article in EPW on the Kerala strategy. And one of the things that struck me very forcefully was the fact that also a number of economic strategies are proposed. What has been the uh, impact on the economy of uh, Kerala at the moment? And how uh, effective or say how easily will the economic strategies that are proposed be able to be put in place? Yeah, from the economic strategy initially was to absorb the shock and reduce the uncertainty. Mm. It was just infusion of cash to the poorest of the people. Mm. Not because the state I told you, the very surprising thing, Kerala is the richest state in India if you take the monthly per capita consumption expenditure. Highest in rural areas and second in urban areas. But in, and in terms of per capita income, we are sixth in India. But if you take state finances, we are probably among the three worst in India because of the huge salary commitments. So the state is not rich enough to infuse cash. So what they're trying to do, they have set up a Kerala bank linking all the cooperatives, hoping that the non-resident remittances, which make up for almost one third of our, uh, of course, it's not part of GDP in that sense, but it makes up one third and keeps the Kerala economy going to all absorb that funds for local level development. Then they have started a big agriculture program, which is already on, uh, on uh, is already under implementation, which is which will give livelihood to some maybe 20, 25% of the people, particularly the poor people. And some big investments, which will take two, three years to come out. But another interesting initiative, pre-COVID, is the right to internet. That should be ready in about one, one and a half years that the internet will be available to every household in Kerala through a public system. The network is being generated using the electricity poles. So it is not very costly. And uh, I think it's half a billion is what has been contracted, is being tendered. And that will be a very interesting innovation. Reach out and that may help local level now. And one more thing I wanted to tell you, some uh, good amount has been given it's about 20 billion rupees to the self-help groups. Which means actual, it's, on a, it's a loan only, but industry loan. They are able to get that for small local economic development activities. That has reached half of this. Yeah, I think that's, uh, that brings us very nicely to the, the role of the self-help groups. Uh, Terry Dunn has a question about the self-help groups. So what was the work that was carried out previously by them before the COVID crisis? And are they politically affiliated? And he would also like to know what proportion of the population is organized through self-help groups. Uh, more than 50% of the population is organized through self-help groups, the bottom half of the population. And here again, probably the scheduled tribes, the ethnic groups have not benefited to the extent they should have, but practically every section has benefited. So it's like a neighborhood group. We call them neighborhood group. We don't call them self-help group in Kerala. And it goes beyond thrift and credit. You have actually a neighborhood group and about 10 women at the neighborhood level, 10, 15 women in a group. And at the panchayat ward level, which is about, as I said, 2,000 people, you are federated into an area development society. And at the panchayat level or municipal level, you're further linked into a registered society, almost a registered community-based organization called Community Development Society. So they can negotiate with the panchayats because they are, and then we said, you work with panchayats. All over India, the self-help groups are parallel to panchayats. That's a big lesson from Kerala. You are not under panchayats, you have equal relationship, but you will work with panchayats at a mutually beneficial relationship. Like when panchayat has to reach out to people, they use SNGs and pay them. And SNGs, because panchayats are very democratic, they can go to village assemblies, ask for uh, various things, and you can't. Even if you, from the narrow point of view of votes, you can't reject 50% people organized and demanding after discussion on the development needs. So that has been a win-win situation in Kerala. So before the COVID, the SNGs were doing self-help, thrift, micro-enterprises, and agriculture, landless agriculture women. But they formed themselves into what are called joint groups, liability groups, and about 50,000 hectares of land is being cultivated, which they don't own. They take it on lease and cultivate. 
and alleviate poverty at that level. So then they do a lot of gender empowerment kind of. Some of them even do what they call crime mapping. Crimes against women, they map and collectively try to redress them. So gender empowerment, gender consciousness is another stream. Then of course, post-COVID, they did phenomenal work. One, they organized all the community kitchens. Uh, about uh, thousand odd, more than thousand community kitchens, one in each village panchayat to feed the people. Immediately they came and many of the joint liability groups gave their produce to the kitchen on payment only, but very small payment. Then 7 million masks were made in the first one month, one, one and a half months. And people didn't know how to make masks, which are now become everybody even uh, brand names are coming out of fashionable masks. Then around, I'm told about 9,000 liters of hand sanitizers in the early days they made. And then they came out in about 50% of these people out of this 4.5 million, half of them have now been linked in WhatsApp groups. So a lot of communication takes place through them and they are counseling the poorest of the elderly, real destitute elderly, they are in touch with them. So these kind of activities are doing, then of course, giving feedback and uh, the, the extension part also, they are involved. And then are they politicized? Yes, in Kerala, nobody's outside politics, but they try to avoid politics in the organization. Within the organization, they avoid politics. A very interesting fact, which, is, uh, which I should state, is that our local governments, 50% of the seats are reserved for women uh, in Kerala. The constitution mandates one third. All over India, it's done. Kerala is 50, and the actual number is about 53, 54. And then in the last elections, which are held in 2015, 62% of the women representatives are from the SAG network. And I studied them across parties. So they are almost in proportion to the strength of different parties, whether it be the Congress, CPM, BJP, Muslim League, all those, all those parties, which means the political parties recognize them. They have politics, but for their interest, that they are not divisive politics is limited. I think that's very interesting in the sense that um, this discussion on women representation in local politics has been going on for a long time uh, after the 1992 change in the constitution. Uh, one of the things that was said when that started was that women were representing, say, the men in their families and they were not having their own ideas. And later research, I think, also showed that that was only too, very partially true. And once women had discovered how important such a political channel could be, that they started uh, to take more decisive action on their own and also train their daughters or younger women to actually take up the, that kind of more independent role. To what extent have you seen women representatives bringing up new issues or issues which specifically relate, for instance, to education or public health or women's empowerment in, in recent times? Uh, I can, there, there, there have not been very detailed studies on that, but since I worked in the local government system for 15 years nonstop in yeah. Kerala from day one of the people's plan, I know that women representatives give greater importance to health, to the, to poverty reduction and for some kind of education, whereas men seem to prefer infrastructure. This is true of whole, con whole country. Some study was made in Maharashtra, which uh, kind of uh, validated this assumption. They seem to be doing it. But then they are able to, one big thing is this partnership with the self-help groups. The women representative and the self-help groups, they constitute a great partnership, which strengthens the uh, elected representative because she has a vast uh, support group, as a, a big support group. So that is again a positive feature of this. Okay, but let's talk about how Kerala can, or say why Kerala's model is or is not actually taken up by the other states in India. Could you say something about how that, say those processes of the extent to which other Indian states governments are actually learning from Kerala or whether they 
reject the model or what what do they accept what and what do they not accept and why yeah what they have accepted is the importance of gram panchayats in fact the government of india is launching what the, they are borrowing a kerala term they call it people's plan campaign for village panchayats from gandhiji's birthday on october 2nd i saw the circular last week mm-hmm. so they have adopted that model of participatory planning for panchayats but beyond that st- strengthening panchayats and real revolution nobody is pushing for barring two three states self help groups everybody is adopting and they are now accepting that self help groups should not be parallel to the local governments they strengthen democracy they strengthen development if they work with the local governments so they have commissioned the kerala's self help group uh, office we have what is called kudumbashree office it's called kudumbashree means family prosperity that's the name of the self help group movement in kerala to go to other states and develop models which they can adopt of self help groups working with the gram panchayats for mutual benefit so that has been accepted in policy recently these two yes uh and welfare welfare pensions and all that good number of states are doing but not the poorest uh states but then the investment in primary education and primary health is not coming for though everybody agrees that kerala model is based on that human development essentially health and education and as i told you till 80s people are laughing at us you are wasting all your money on teachers and doctors and your growth rate is 1% but now 21st century people say is much more sustainable maybe you are exporting human resources but still is your education which has pushed you to the top in terms of as i said uh, at least consumption expenditure which is the best indicator of your prosperity so people are now almost theorizing that human development after a lag will bring in economic development that will be a kind of a big lesson all over developing world human development Maybe a lag will lead to sustainable economic growth. Right. Basil would like to know, say, when the more freedom of movement starts to return, do the authorities in Kerala anticipate or fear that a significant number of people will migrate from other states to benefit from the health care which you have available? And so uh, will that put the local health system under greater stress? say pre covid situation the figures are nobody has taken real statistics but everybody says that 2 and 1/2 million people from kerala are working outside kerala particularly in the gulf and some in european countries mm-hmm. and almost an equal number is coming mostly from the poorer parts of india in the east to kerala so it's a very neat simple displacement people of kerala have vacated they are coming in to fill the gaps so beyond that we don't expect people to come and that will not be a strain that will not be a strain because they are contributing to kerala's economic growth because when 2 and 1/2 lakh people who are workers leave then 2 and 1/2 million people workers leave then you need somebody to do many of this now if you go to hotels more than 50 60% of the hotel work is done by migrants from other states so rubber tapping which used to be a uniquely kerala skill has now been taken over by these people so these kind of jobs are being filled in. no resistance they are paid as any other person and so this is a very harmonious situation i don't anticipate it to go in a different direction the balance will not be disturbed if we look at say the rest of india what have been the strategies that people themselves have taken up to deal with covid um we've seen we saw at least internationally after the locked the sudden lockdown that a very large numbers of people started going back to their home villages especially those who had been working in cities and had lost their job from one day to the other what have been the additional kind of strategies that local communities to which these migrants have returned have taken to to deal with uh, with the pandemic basically two things even india's agriculture contributes less than 15% to its Mm. gdp but i must say it is should be thankful that agriculture has saved india so agriculture crop was bamba crop and people expect the next crop to be even better so that saved india and many of these people of the agriculture seems to have the capacity to absorb a lot of people 
Nearly 50% of India's workers are in agriculture, though it contributes only 15%. You know the wages and other issues. But then the additional marginal uh, involvement uh, in agriculture has helped these people. So they have gone to the, the farms. Another big thing which is unexpected is the National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme has absorbed double the amount in the COVID period. Which means many of the return workers have been working this for the village pond or village road, that public works program of the employment guarantee. These two have been the main coping strategies. But to what extent has the return of so many people to their villages actually led to, say, the spread of COVID in the rural areas? And what have people been able to do about that? The presumed evidence shows that it is not as bad as it was feared. But they went in the early part and most of them were not infected. And many villages, there again, the panchayats and the local self-help groups try, kind of uh, quarantined them in schools, in some houses in the beginning. So when they reached, so that quarantine system worked very well in the early parts of COVID when these migrants uh, returned. So it was not as bad as it was here. And did you see very many, say, a great deal of difference between the high caste and low caste uh, communities in the villages and the, yeah, their situations? Y yes, obviously. In the rest of India, I can only guess. In Kerala, the caste system is not that bad now, though we had the worst caste system 100 years ago. It's improved. So caste-based discrimination is more inside the mind and not outside, which we see in the whole of the world now. So, but rest of India, there could be uh, problems. But since this scheduled caste and other people are again agriculture, labor, and the labor is priced now, probably economically, they would not have slipped, but they would have had problems when there was a rationing of services. Obviously, the, the, the so-called low cost lose out. Okay, so we have a question from uh, Vishnu. What is your suggestion in the current context to control the epidemic? It seems to be what is universally accepted now. Mask, distance, that seems to be the only way. Till the vaccination comes, I don't see any other way. And this so social implementation of these restrictions seem to be better rather than government trying to do it directly where there's a, some kind of social pressure which will work more in rural areas than in urban areas. Even Kerala is now advocating this. Keep a distance, wear a mask, wash your hands, which now seems to be the universal, uh, yeah. universal accepted thing. Yeah. But of course, the Kerala model of intermediation at the social level so you can talk to somebody who will look after you. So that confidence is again, should be an important part of it. Indeed, indeed. Otherwise not practicing on your own and uh, that yeah. Yeah. India, what will happen to me if I call it. Yeah. I think uh, you've given us a very interesting insight into the Kerala model. And what strikes me the most is that it's very much a combination of both systemic preparation, and the advanced preparations and, and uh, readiness that you talked about, combined with a very multi-level kind of institutional support given to the majority of the population, with perhaps the exception of the tribals. And it's been very inspiring to hear this from you, that in fact, it doesn't require high technology, new apps, et cetera, et cetera, but basically a well-functioning government and also organization, self-organization of many of, say, in the local community, and a strong social cohesion, as you say, social capital and trust in government. This was very inspiring to hear from you, and uh, we look forward to further exchanges. So I would like, to, on behalf of all of us who've been here in this webinar, to thank you very much indeed for spending your time and your insights with us. And we appreciate that for a great deal. Thank you Welcome. very much indeed. Welcome. And I enjoyed my one hour interacting and I liked your questions. They're quite sharp. And uh, so I enjoyed it. And I hope we'll continue this if required later. So bye. Yeah, thank you very much. Many thanks. And um, let me say then on behalf of Iyadi,
that uh, we will be having further webinars on this topic in the broad sense. And perhaps you could say just a little bit on that, Basile, to finalize our, our meeting. Yes, thank you, Isa, and uh, thank you, sir, for uh, a very insightful talk on Kerala. We have a few other talks lined up on COVID as part of our series, and the next one will be the 15th of October on lockdown challenges for land reform beneficiaries in South Africa. So we will move away from uh, India after these two seminars, and we will look at uh, South Africa, and also we will have other seminars on Latin America with Peru in particular. So thank you very much and wish you, wishing you all a very good evening or afternoon, wherever you are. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.